Open systems architectures are a key technological element in the evolution of sustainment. To learn more about the concept, let's hear from Jeffrey Howington, Principal Business Development Manager at Collins Aerospace. The idea for open systems is to allow for customers, for suppliers, for others to be able to have insight into that system such that they can uh, place capabilities into that system without having to go into any kind of specialized education about how the system was constructed or what interfaces it's using. So it's really, you know, when you think about the life cycle of the system and the government wants to get new capability, updated capability into the field as fast as possible, and and they want to keep it continually modernized so that they now can, can counter those rapidly changing threats, which characterize the the modern battle space of today. So it's a great way for us to be able to put out a new weapon system or even update a legacy or enduring system in a very cost-effective and rapid manner. We've been at open systems architecture for well over 20 years now, beginning with the KC-135 aircraft. And through reusability concepts that we get with OSA, We've been able to update and transfer that technology into many, many different aircraft for all of the different services. So, for example, the CH-47F platform utilizes the common avionics architecture system, and uh, we've been able to move that into several of the Navy aircraft uh, back in the 2000s for the P3, the C2, and the uh, E2 aircraft, and we've now moved that forward toward the CH-53K aircraft as well. Collins Aerospace is pursuing such work through several projects, including the FACE Consortium. This refers to the Open Group Future Airborne Capability Environment, which develops open architecture standards in the aviation domain. Collins Aerospace was a founding member of the FACE Consortium, and I served as its vice chair uh, for over nine years. And the ultimate reason for the consortium getting started was because of the amount of software that was getting into weapon systems platforms, depending on who you ask, anywhere from 70 to 90 percent of a, a weapon systems functionality is being implemented as part of software. And like you've seen in in stories out in the field, uh, you know, software is very costly. I mean, it's very complicated. And so if you've got 70 to 90 percent of that software implementing that capability, you know, if you get behind with that, uh, you can run up costs very, very quickly. You can run up schedules very, very quickly. And so the consortium got down to business to answer the question, how can we make this more efficient? And they developed essentially the technical as well as the business capabilities for companies using the FACE standard uh, to be able to utilize those open interfaces and put in those capabilities that the weapon systems need and utilize those standards which many software developers are familiar with, things like POSIX or OpenGL, ARANK 661, those types of things are being built in the FACE Consortium, the FACE Technical Standard, puts that into a framework whereby you get the modularity and therefore the reuse of software that goes into that framework across different platforms. That's a very powerful way of being able to incorporate the world-class capabilities that systems need and as well, uh, you've got the capability of reducing cost. What does this mean in practical terms? At heart, it's about overcoming the threats of the modern battlefield. Open architecture is about open. So you've got open interfaces, you've got the framework by which you get the modularity, you get the reuse of software. And sustainment in that kind of a context is really all about updating your technology and modernizing your your weapon system or your platform Uh, such that you're keeping up with uh, the threats that are arrayed against you. And those threats, a lot of those are now being driven by a lot of commercial technologies. 
and commercial technologies are, are rapidly updated uh, over time. So uh, let me give me an example of one piece of software that uh, we've seen over the years has benefited uh, from adhering to open standards. And, and that's our mission flight management software product. This is the one that was selected by the US Navy for use on uh, naval aircraft. Uh, the history of that software product goes back to the early 70s uh, when we implemented that as part of a commercial airline fleet uh, and we have been bringing that software up to date uh, continuously for many, many decades since that time. Uh, and we've now implemented that successfully on over 50 different type model series of aircraft, both commercial as well as military. This achievement would not have been possible without an open standards approach. Imagine, if you would, uh, you've got software developers coming in, they have their history behind them as far as different programs and projects, uh, but with a common set of standards that are commercially available, developers can become very familiar with those standards. And as they become familiar, they're able to move from project to project and not have to relearn things. Now you're able to concentrate on innovating that underlying product, not trying to get it from one place to the other. Militaries depend on a digital backbone to support and enhance their sustainment strategies and ensure fleet readiness. Let's turn to Geoffrey Howington again to outline the importance of the concept. The digital backbone is a very important part because it does provide that framework within a system to allow for easily updating and bringing in new technologies. Uh, there are two parts, of course. You've got you've got a digital backbone, which is going to incorporate networking and computing resources. Uh, those computing resources are also going to have to have the framework by which you plug in your software. And so this is where the face technical standard comes in uh, as far as identifying those elements inside of that software framework so you can place those reusable software components from different platforms onto uh, the platform that, that you have interest in. So when you get to a point where, let's say 10 years down the road, and you are very interested in putting in that, that new technology, now you've got that framework to fall back on. You have familiarity with that framework. You have third parties uh, outside, let's say, of a company like Collins, who also have familiarity with that tech standard. And now they can build those new capabilities independently of us or a prime and present that to us as an ability for us to upgrade and enhance the value of our offering to the government. So that that's providing value to us, it's providing value to the government, and it's providing value to the warfighter. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has placed a spotlight on the threat of peer and near-peer rivals. In this context, multi-domain operations are increasingly in focus for the US and its allies. Open systems architectures will play a vital role in this environment. Multi-domain operation is certainly governing a lot of thought as far as what, where our new capabilities need to go. Uh, in order to survive the modern battlefield that's governed by multi-domain operations concepts, You've got a lot of complexity coming at you. And again, you know, our adversaries have the means and have the processes there for updating their systems. And we have to be as quick as, as they are, if not quicker, uh, in order to provide a credible defense. The open systems architecture is that way of providing uh, the framework for bringing in those new capabilities in a rapid pace and has been identified to me. It's not a matter of you know, keeping the status quo as far as our traditional acquisition process. That acquisition process, the traditional acquisition process takes years in order for us to get new capability out into the field. With multi-domain operations, we have to get to a point where we are upgrading 
uh, and developing new capabilities as fast as months, if not days, if not hours, we have to get those new capabilities into place in order to meet the threats that can be coming at us just as fast. Episode four of the Critical Care podcast is out now on shepherdmedia.com forward slash news or wherever you get your podcasts.